Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are honored to welcome at Ukraine Crisis Media Center His Excellency Jeffrey Pyatt, United States Ambassador to Ukraine. Please. Dobro Thank you, Natalia. Um, thank you again to friends at the Crisis Media Center. It feels like it's been about 100 years since I've last been here, and there's been a little bit of news recently. So it's a good time to take stock, um, sort of review where we are and a couple of key issues. Let me begin, if I might, um, with a couple of comments. First of all, uh, regarding Ukraine, and just to note um, my own sort of deep uh, sense of respect for the dignity with which the Ukrainian people have responded to the tragedy in Donetsk and the, the downing of Malaysian Flight 17. Um, my house is just about 100 meters from the, the Dutch Embassy. And so I've driven by every morning and have seen the sea of flowers um, that is now on Kontraktova Plostra. And the, the obvious and, and sincere um, condolences that the Ukrainian people have, have offered in the face of this international tragedy. Um, I think it's also important to take note of the leadership that uh, Prime Minister Yatsenyuk and, and President Poroshenko exercised in delegating the international lead on this investigation uh, to the Netherlands. It was an important political step in order to um, remove any doubt about the credibility and the transparency of the international investigation that needs to be conducted to ensure that the truth comes out in terms of what exactly um, precipitated the SA-11 shootdown um, of Malaysian Flight, Flight 17. Um, and it was an important step. You can see the, the, the broad international coalition that the Netherlands is now um, assembling in order to ensure a thorough and unimpeded investigation. Um, there is a large international team which is now assembled in Kharkiv including a broad range of technical experts from many of the countries affected by this tragedy, including multiple experts from the US FBI. Um, we are committed, uh, in fact, we must ensure uh, first um, that the remains of all of the victims um, are brought home, and then that the investigation is conducted in a way that reflects uh, the best of international cooperation that acknowledges um, that these sunflower fields are now essentially a giant crime scene and they need to be treated that way. They need to be secured. Uh, further disruption um, of, the, of the wreckage must be stopped um, and the truth must be brought out in a way that the whole international community can stand behind. Um, we are, of course, following very closely the work that is being done at the site. Um, we support strongly the efforts of the OSCE Special Monitoring Mission that has been facilitating access to the site, including this afternoon. But I think it's also tragic um, that the site has still not fully been secured that there is not unimpeded access for the investigators yet allowed, and that the separatists have declined to reciprocate the uh, correct and courageous decision that President Poroshenko took in committing to a 40-kilometer exclusion zone to demilitarize the crash site region so that it is safe and secure for the investigators to do their job. And as President Obama said, to ensure that the truth comes out. For us, for the United States, as you've seen from various comments, including from my president, briefings in Washington by our intelligence community, um, what happened to Malaysian Flight 17 is not a mystery. We know that the aircraft was brought down by an SA-11 missile fired from separatist-controlled territory. We know that separatist training camps continue to operate in Russian territory. We know that Russia continues to send tanks, rocket launchers, heavy armor across the Ukrainian border. 
think one of the great tragedies is that in the eight days since the shoot down of the aircraft, rather than take this, as we all hope, as an opportunity to, to put this crisis back on a political and diplomatic track towards resolution. Instead, what we have seen from the Kremlin is pouring gasoline on the fire. What we have seen is the escalation, the escalation of military transfers across the Ukrainian border. We talked publicly yesterday about the alarming development of artillery fire from into sovereign Ukrainian territory. Ru Russian units, units in Russia, firing across the border into Ukrainian territory, targeting Ukrainian military units. We also have expressed our concern about what we have seen inside Russia, including the possibility that Russia may be mobilizing still more heavy and advanced weapons, including um, more advanced rocket systems, which points to a further escalation of the crisis at a moment when President Obama has emphasized his commitment to finding a diplomatic off-ramp, at a moment when President Poroshenko has reaffirmed his commitment to a political solution, resting on his peace plan to include the greater devolution of authority, constitutional reform, guarantees for Russian language, and importantly, investment in the now daunting project of reconstruction of the Donbas to undo the damage that was done to help the people of eastern Ukraine as part of a sovereign, unified Ukraine to rebuild their lives, restore a sense of normalcy, and over time enjoy the economic benefits of a Ukraine which is moving closer to Europe, which is moving closer to an institutional relationship with Europe. So with those comments, uh, be happy to take any questions. Please raise your hand. Sure. Please introduce yourself. Um, so you've spoken about the uh, evidence of uh, training camps inside the Russian Federation and of the uh, weapons armaments pouring into Ukraine. Uh, and also evidence of uh, shelling of Ukraine territory from inside Russia. And, uh, I was wondering if, um, if there's any evidence, visual or otherwise, that uh, the United States is able to make public and available to us uh, to back up those claims. Well, um, as you know, um, we've already released some imagery from the Rostov region. Um, it's imagery which demonstrates how these facilities are seeing a stepped-up level of military activity. Um, I think uh, Marie yesterday in Washington made the point that the latest statements from the United States reflect a consolidated intelligence view, some of which, of course, we're not going to be prepared to talk about. But I think what I would emphasize standing here in Kyiv if we roll back the clock to the end of February or March, we can all remember the Russian denials. Um, there are no Russian troops invading Crimea. Um, these aren't our little green men. Um, history, of course, tells us that those little green men, in fact, were Russian special forces. Um, history tells us that this fog of uncertainty that was created by the Kremlin eventually led to the illegal annexation of Crimea. So I think bearing that history in mind, uh, bearing in mind what the separatists themselves have said, and I think it's worth remembering uh, these multiple telephone intercepts which the SBU has, has released. We have conducted our own voice print analysis of those intercepts and have concluded that they are genuine. And what those intercepts tell us is that the separatists that the Russian citizens who lead the so-called Donetsk People's Republic are getting regular direction and regular contact with people in, uh, and authorities in Russia. Um, so I think the, the picture is pretty clear when you combine the totality of intelligence information, uh, Ukrainian information, the statements of the separatists themselves. Uh, we have the Vostok Battalion leader's acknowledgment 
of the possession of the book missile system. So um, again, there will of course be limits to what we are prepared to say publicly when it comes to our intelligence information. But I think the totality of the picture should be clear to anybody who has their eyes open. Please, whoever, yeah. Gabriela Wojcinska, Reuters News Agency. Ambassador, um, you noted a few days ago that most of the rebel leaders in Donetsk are actually Russian citizens right now. What is your understanding of how this process works? Is it just people who know each other from you know, past military experience from Crimea, from Transnistria, and they just call one another and go? Or do you think, and is your understanding that Russia, the Russian state authorities are actively helping them organize, facilitating their trip to Donetsk? And I'm not talking about fighters, I'm talking about the leaders now. Thank right. you. Um, excellent question. I look forward to seeing what Reuters and others are able to, to peel back on that. I think what I would say is, first of all, we know that these individuals are in regular touch with authorities in Russia. Um, we know that the Deputy Prime Minister of the Donetsk People's Republic was a Russian intelligence operative in Transnistria. Um, we know that um, there has been a dramatic change in the leadership of the Donetsk People's Republic over the, the past weeks. Um, which certainly gives the impression of a much more hands-on Russian-directed role. Um, but I simply can't answer your question in terms of the degree to which um, there is a single node in Moscow which is providing command and control to these groups, um, or if Russia's role instead um, has been a facilitating one. But what's very clear is that Vladimir Putin could stop this with one phone call. Uh, the Kremlin could stop this with a clear signal to the separatists that it's time to accommodate themselves to the Ukrainian constitution, to Ukrainians' democratic order um, established through credible and widely participated elections on the 25th of May, um, and that it's time, most importantly, to stop the killing, to stop the violence, and to stop sending equipment across the Russian border, which obviously would not be happening nor, for that matter, firing across the Russian border by heavy artillery and rocket systems without the explicit and, I assume, directed acquiescence and direction of Russian decision makers. We have a question in the back, please. Mm -hmm. Tell me, please. There is an active discussion of sanctions which, uh, which uh, some countries pass, uh, some uh, don't approve. The position of the U.S., will you introduce a sanctions, uh, most strong of, uh, sanctions against Russia? Are you going to do that? Strong of sanctions against uh, Russia, will, are you planning to have that? Do um, let me say two things. First, um, the objective of this exercise is not sanctions for their own sake. It is not to damage the Russian economy for its own sake. It is to change the Kremlin's political calculus, to encourage a diplomatic off-ramp, uh, to encourage the Kremlin to make the political choice, the strategic choice, to move towards rapprochement with the Poroshenko government, to move towards rapprochement with the Ukrainian people. Um, we have made clear that we are prepared in the face of Russian escalation, which unambiguously has occurred over the past week. The measures of that escalation over the past week include artillery firing across the border, the transmission of additional and the transfer of additional heavy armor, tanks, rocket systems across the Ukrainian border, um, and the mobilization of additional military units additional training facilities inside Russian territory. So the escalation is there. We've made clear that we are prepared, as long as that escalation continues, to raise the cost to the Kremlin. Uh, we have emphasized our commitment to doing so jointly with our European partners. In this regard, um, as I speak, of course, uh, developments are unfolding in Brussels. We will watch those with great interest. And I'm confident that the United States will have additional things to say in this regard as well. David from uh, New York Times, please. 
Ambassador, the United States and its allies have invested a lot of political capital in uh, the Ukrainian government. Arseny Yatsenyuk sat in the Oval Office with President Obama in March. Can you tell us how concerned you are about the chaos in the government right now? His resignation yesterday, his warnings that the government is running out of money at a time when the, when the U.S. and others in the West backed an extraordinary access a credit package to the IMF worth, uh, as we know, $17 billion. Thanks. Thanks, David. Um, let me say a couple of things. Um, First and foremost, uh, the question of Ukraine's political order, Ukraine's political leadership, um, is for Ukraine's constitutional authorities to work out. Uh, so we will look forward to working with the authorities who are selected um, through that constitutional process, whoever they may be. Um, I would also note, I think we all have enormous respect for what Prime Minister Yatsenyuk has accomplished um, since March. Um, he and his government um, accomplished an election that many people said would never happen. Um, he and his government um, set the stage for the signature of the association agreement, which President Poroshenko completed. Um, he and his government achieved an IMF agreement which the Azarov government um, never came close to during its time in office. He and his team um, moved ahead on overdue and necessary reforms, which are intended to clean up much of the, the, the disaster of governance that the Yanukovych years bequeathed to this country. Um, distorted energy pricing, rampant corruption, uh, distorted agricultural markets. In all of those sectors, what I hear from my business interlocutors is enormous relief that the process of repairing that damage has advanced as it did under Prime Minister Yatsenyuk's tenure. The most important consideration for the United States going forward is that whichever government order emerges from Ukraine's constitutional processes needs to stick to the hard, painful, and necessary path of economic reform. There are no shortcuts to the difficult measures which are part of IMF conditionality. Um, and sticking to that path, especially now when Ukraine has already made the hard first steps, is critically important and is something that whoever um, picks up the reins now as prime minister, uh, we hope will be able to, to sustain and carry forward. To the extent they do, to the extent that individual does, they will enjoy the support of the United States. Thank you. We have a question in the back, please. Um, Mr. Ambassador, Captain George Mills, uh, a little bit of a multi-part question. One of President uh, Obama's goals uh, in his terms of office have been to uh, uh, minimize and uh, eliminate as many nuclear weapons in the world as he possibly can. Right now, there's ongoing efforts in the United States to uh, 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 prevent uh, countries such as uh, Iran uh, from uh, developing uh, and acquiring nuclear weapons. Um, how does the world, how does the United States tell the citizens of Iran that nuclear weapons are not necessary to guarantee their territorial in integrity, especially when you look at it in light of years ago Ukraine was a uh, number three nuclear power in, in the world, and they voluntarily gave up their nuclear weapons. So if I was an Iranian citizen, I would say these weapons are needed to guarantee our territorial integrity. And uh, echoing the words of uh, Senator McCain, uh, shouldn't the United States be doing a little bit more a little bit faster? Uh, uh, second uh, uh, question is your website had uh, uh, commented about uh, buying infrared cameras uh, to help protect the integrity of the uh, border. Um, and it, it uh, kind of patted itself on the back for uh, uh, purchasing those infrared cameras in Kiev. Uh, the best manufacturer of infrared cameras uh, is FLIR, company FLIR. Um, they make uh, 
uh, new technology. Uh, the old technology had a refresh rate of 9 frames per second. The new technology is 30 frames per second. I have checked with the dealers in Kiev. Only the old technology cameras are available in Kiev. Uh, so therefore, if they were bought in Kiev, they were the old technology with a refresh rate of 9 frames per second. Can we please move to the question part so we can... Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Um, Thanks. Why weren't uh, 30 frames uh, per second cameras brought in from the United States and, and supplied up right. to uh, yeah. the border? Let me just say, George, I, I'll leave the Iran questions to my colleagues in Vienna and Washington. Um, I've got <laughs> enough to grapple oh, with you're, here, you're here in back, Kiev. Huh? <laughs> um, on the question of our military assistance to the Ukrainian government, to the state border guard, I'll just say a couple of things. First of all, um, our assistance to all elements of the Ukrainian security establishment um, has, it has grown substantially. It's now up to a figure of $33 million uh, that we will be looking to obligate over the course of this year for a broad array of programs. Uh, one of the priority areas of effort for the United States is our work with the State Border Guard Service precisely to help Ukraine to harden its frontiers, uh, to stop this infiltration of weapons and fighters across the border. Um, I'm not going to get into refresh rates and pixels and everything else, um, but I can assure you that the American experts who are working with their State Border Guard counterparts um, are looking to provide systems and technologies that provide the, the, best, the best effectiveness possible in the circumstances that Ukrainian, Ukraine now faces. Um, I should note also that especially on the border issues, um, I'm very pleased that our efforts are unfolding simultaneously with the EU's. Um, the EU has their new CSDP program here in Ukraine. Uh, we expect to continue to partner closely with Brussels, partnering closely with the CSDP office here in Kyiv to help to build Ukrainian capacity and to help the Ukrainian authorities um, build a safe and secure country. All right. Uh, Carol Morello with the Washington Post. What's your assessment of the progress the Ukrainian military is making against the separatists in the East? Thanks, Carol. Um, I think I'll, I'll leave that largely to the NSDC and the ATO office. I think all of us have, have gotten in the habit of checking the maps that the, that the ATO office publishes every day, that little hand-shaped ATO region. Uh, clearly, in a geographic sense, uh, the government has made significant progress. Um, they published um, the published assessments that the ATO has done, uh, the ATO office has done, uh, comport with the American analysis that I see of, of what's happening um, in the region. We obviously rely a great deal on the journalists who are out there. Um, there are, in, in some ways, sort of two drivers of this right now. The first and most important driver is Russia. Uh, Russia is continuing to pump in weapons and fighters uh, we've seen some heavy clashes, of course, in the, the southeastern sector on the border, um, and I think that's reflected in the, the ATO office maps that, that we've all seen as well. Um, I think it's very important uh, that the government uh, has continued and has reaffirmed, uh, as President Poroshenko did in public the other day, his commitment not to go down the, the rabbit hole of martial law um, to avoid an urban combat situation and instead to try to accomplish um, around these major urban centers um, the same kind of uh, gradual uh, normalization that they accomplished in Slavyansk. Um, I would also note, and I think it's quite interesting to see, and again I, I look forward to some of the, the reporting that you all will do. Um, it's been quite striking as I've seen accounts from cities like Slavyansk, um, where the Donetsk People's Republic, where the DNR forces have withdrawn, um, this enormous sense of relief. Uh, I saw pictures yesterday, the day before, you know, young women with flower in the, flowers in their hair and, and Ukrainian flags. Uh, people in Slavyansk, uh, you know, painting benches and curbs, uh, blue and yellow. 
Um, I don't imagine, or one would expect, and some of the reporting has made clear that the deep problem of political distrust that has to be overcome. Uh, I was quite impressed by Simon Ostrowski's reporting from Slavyansk immediately after the, the separatists withdrew. You know, these are people who've been subjected, bombarded by Russian propaganda in a region that was originally and has, has long been economically underdeveloped. Uh, you have people who were bombarded by, by Russian propaganda um, about the fascists and the, 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 uh, the putsch that had been accomplished in, in Kyiv. All of us who are here know that that's a, a totally false narrative. The burden is on the government to begin to overcome that. Um, I think the government has done the right thing in terms of moving as quickly as possible to restore services, uh, to restore electricity, water. I know from talking to the government that that's a priority. The United States has made some modest contributions, including through some of our NGO partners, to support that kind of immediate relief. But more needs to be done. And longer term, um, as law and order is restored in eastern Ukraine, there will be the much bigger project of helping to ensure that as Ukraine moves ahead towards uh, a closer institutional relationship and, and hopefully a future of greater economic prosperity, that the people of Donbas feel that they are part of that. Um, I know from talking to business and political leaders from that part of the country that they understand that, um, the, the, the key oligarchs from, from the Donbas region who understand the economic opportunity that uh, the European Association Agreement represents. But there, there will be work to be done uh, to help this region um, attack the, the, uh, the poverty and underdevelopment um, that has been the driver of, of much of the unhappiness. Um, once the, the Russian, the combustible Russian uh, government intervention is hopefully removed from the picture. Mr. Ambassador, we have a question in Russian from Maidan activist. International Department of uh, Maidan. You know, in Russia, they have a song, Don't Waste a Time, America, Give Up Your uh, Alaska. Well, what's your opinion? If we don't stop uh, Russian ambitions, well, if we don't stop them here, will they go to Alaska? We're all Alaskans now. Um, <laughs> Ukraine can't change its geography. Um, Ukraine needs to have a normal relationship with Russia. Um, but that normal relationship can only come on the basis of sovereignty, respect for the choices of the Ukrainian people and their democratically elected leaders, and a recognition of what I think is now pretty clear, which is Ukraine's future in Europe. Uh, Ukraine's institutional future in Europe. Um, obviously, there are debates in Russia today about what that relationship should look like. There have been some sweeping statements made by some in Moscow suggesting somehow that, that Ukraine never really should have been independent. But I, I have yet to find a single Ukrainian who questions that independence, who questions Ukraine's sovereignty. Uh, for the United States, our policy will be premised on supporting that sovereignty and supporting those sovereign choices. Um, so I think you know that is the frame within which we need to understand um, the the future of Ukraine's relationship with Russia. This is not a zero-sum relationship. It should not be a zero-sum relationship. There are many business people and others in Russia who could profit handsomely from a Ukraine which is economically dynamic, rooted in European institutions, enjoying duty-free access to the largest economic bloc in the world. Um, but that's not going to happen if Russia continues to alienate itself from the Ukrainian government and from the Ukrainian people through its egregious interventions. Uh, I have talked before, I mean, this is a five-month campaign of destabilization. 
which began with the invasion, occupation, and illegal annexation of Crimea and reached a tragic culmination um, a week ago Thursday uh, in Donetsk. Uh, that has to end. That must end. Thank you. I think we have one more question. Just, just one more question. Do you have any update on, you, uh, on Don Skiba, the, the freelance journalist working for CNN who has been captured, uh, seized by the terrorists in Donetsk on July 22? Well, let me say, uh, say a couple of things. Um, again, uh, I have been alarmed to see the pattern of kidnappings, um, intimidation against media outlets uh, across the Donbass, um, the abduction of CNN Stringer literally from the hotel room where he was working is the most recent and egregious instance of this. But it, there are dozens of other reporters, um, some of whom were taken into that terrible dungeon in Slavyansk. And where are they now? Nobody knows. Um, it is, I think, a signifier of the uh, of the Russia-supported separatist movement, that there has been such a strong focus on the media, um, on using information warfare as part of the separatist campaign, um, on weaponizing uh, information, seizing television towers, intimidating journalists. I see now they've also announced, even to the Western press, that they won't be allowed to report from so-called combat areas. So um, I think we need to have our eyes wide open to this. The United States believes strongly in the principle of media freedom, and that means everybody, including Russia Today stringers. Um, but the important thing is the free press, professional journalists need to be allowed to do their jobs. And certainly we condemn unequivocally um, the, uh, the kidnapping of CNN Stringer and hope very much that whoever's holding him, whatever dungeon he is being held in, uh, that he will be freed as quickly as possible. Thank you, colleagues. Do we have any more questions? Um, May I ask? Sure. Yes. Uh, <coughs> I follow in Russia. <laughs> uh, it would be interesting because we discuss the technical issues, but if you look strategically, globally, into the future, how deep could be relations between Ukraine, the U.S., Georgia, the U.S., Moldova, the U.S., but I am mostly interested in, in Ukraine and the U.S. Because there are, we have clever people, you have a lot of clever people in the U.S., and uh, we can uh, develop a, a legal base for cooperation. How how deep our relations can go, and uh, what kind of legal format it can take? The question. Um, we are deeply committed to our strategic partnership with Ukraine. Um, one of the things that has struck me from my first days in this country, uh, almost a year ago now, is the breadth of areas in which we are and should be engaged, from energy to agriculture to information technology to space. We have a strong people-to-people -people relationship, which rests on the foundation of the Ukrainian diaspora in the United States. You see that in the very strong American congressional interest in developments here in Ukraine, the desire to ensure that we are seen to be supporting the sovereign choice of the Ukrainian people. Uh, so I see tremendous possibilities for this relationship. Our trade and investment relationship is massively underdeveloped. It should be much bigger than it is. The critical determinant of growth in that relationship is the Ukrainian government's struggle against corruption. Rooting out the cancer of corruption is essential to the success of this government, but it is also the essential prerequisite, the essential enabler of growing our trade and investment relationship to the size that it should occupy. Uh, you know, this is, this is a country the size of Spain. Um, we should have a trade account that's just as big. Uh, we should have much more investment 
in areas of, of aerospace, information technology, agro-industry, food services, financial services. But all of these are sectors that are impeded right now by concerns that I hear from American investors um, about transparency of government, about the business climate, about the corrosive evil the, of corruption. Um, we will make a concerted effort in this area in the months ahead. Um, we expect in the fall to host a major Ukraine trade and investment conference in the United States intended to signal to American investors and American companies the administration's support under the leadership of Secretary of Commerce Pritzker for deepening our trade and investment relationship. But the work, the hard work of changing Ukraine's business environment is going to have to be done here in Kyiv. Thank you so much. I believe we're, this is all. Thank you very much for coming again to Ukraine Crisis Media Center. Always happy to see you. Thank you for your yeah. support. Thanks so much, and thank you so much for the work that the Media Center is doing. Do pobaczenia.